West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com While Justice Alito is facing well-earned criticism for these trips, there's another person who's played a role akin to matchmaker between conservative justices and billionaires. And that person is Leonard Leo. He's a guy on the left, conservative activist, co-chairman of the Federalist Society. According to ProPublica's reporting, it was Leo who helped organize the fishing trip in 2008, invited Paul Singer and asked Singer if he, could, if he and Justice Alito could fly on his jet. Here's Leonard Leo on that luxury fishing trip. He's the guy in the center of the photo holding the fish in his left hand on the right side. And remember this photorealistic painting depicting Harlan Crow and his pal, Justice Clarence Thomas? The guy on the left, second to the left with the steepled fingers, is Leonard Leo. Mr. Leo refused to answer questions about the fishing trip, but he issued a statement lambasting ProPublica's reporting on the conservative justice's ethical lapses. It says in part, quote, We all should wonder whether this recent rash of ProPublica stories questioning the integrity of only conservative Supreme Court justices is bait for reeling in more dark money from woke billionaires who want to damage the Supreme Court and remake it into one that will disregard the law by rubber stamping their disordered and highly unpopular cultural preferences, end quote. And that particular peculiar statement prompted this response from Dahlia Lithwick, a senior editor for Slate who writes about the court, quote, the hilarity of hearing dark money from woke billionaires from the guy who was connecting unwoke billionaires to justices for travel and influence. It's amazing the level of projection, end quote. All right, what's left to do except to talk to Dahlia Lithwick about this? She's the senior editor for Slate, uh, the host, host of the Amicus podcast. Dahlia, good to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having this me This story back. gets stranger and stranger by the day. But what we didn't get to talk about last night when we went in depth with the ProPublica reporter was Leonard Leo. This guy is the Where's Waldo of conservative justices. He's always around. He's in the picture. He's there. So to the extent that this was not a random fishing trip that Alito and this billionaire went on, the guy in the middle, ostensibly the guy who's always in the middle, is Leonard Leo. Right. He's the travel agent yeah. who has no interest in reshaping the court, to be sure. He just likes traveling with justices and billionaires. Right. I mean, it's really amazing that quote you just read, the statement he gave to ProPublico talking about, you know, the woke, uh, dark money uh, uh, left here. And the idea that he doesn't have an interest in reshaping the court. Right. I mean, the reason the court is hearing those cases you talked about at the beginning, rehearing affirmative action, rehearing whether you can deny service to LGBTQ customers, that's because he reshaped the court. Right. That's the why those cases are back. And just to be clear, the, the Leonard Leo and the Federalist Society prepared lists of judges that Donald Trump could pick from, pre-vetted, to say that conservatives will approve of these people if you pick them. Leonard Leo is not a casual observer to the shaping of the Supreme Court of the United States of America. He is possibly the guy whose thumb has most been on the scale. 
Uh, not only that, but he brags about it. Yes. This is something that he has been lauded for, feted for, given, you know, awards and praise. Don McGahn, you know, this is a thing that, you know, he gives elaborate interviews to the Washington Post, to the New Yorker saying, yep, yeah, I'm the guy. I yeah. did this. Right. And the idea that he is then in photos with people. And he says, oh, we're not talking about right. the business of the court. It's super weird that I'm sitting here with Clarence Thomas and Harlan Crow and Mark Pauletta, but we're talking about sports. Right. I mean, it's just the fatuousness of the defense. Take the win. You reshape yeah. the court. You got these billionaires. You've got a big brother program where you match up a multi-billionaire with the Supreme Court justice and you have them lavish them with right. gifts and things. Take the win. Right. You did it. Right. Don't give interviews about it. So here's the interesting thing. Yesterday, about 6.30 p.m., in addition to the idea that ProPublica's reporting had already come out, uh, this uh, op-ed, or, or not the op-ed, but um, well, it wasn't op-ed, by, by Justice Alito, had been printed in the Wall Street Journal. At 6.30 yesterday evening, they came out and attacked ProPublica, saying that they are trying to damage the court, right, by, by reporting on it. The language is very similar to Leonard, Leonard Leo's language here. The idea that by reporting on justices and their ethics you are thereby damaging the court now as journalists that doesn't appear that doesn't apply anywhere else everywhere else it's holding people to account but somehow with the supreme court if you report on them in a negative way you're damaging the institution right this is classic shoot the messenger right, right. this is all of those of us who actually really do love and care about the court and would like it to function with dignity would like it to model sobriety and seriousness the way we're not seeing modeled on the floor of right. the house we're not actually trying to take down the court what we're saying is abide by the rules all justice alito needed to do was disclose if he had yeah, disclosed, this is really let's make this he didn't have he could take everything that was given to him he just needed to disclose yeah i mean it's he can't i mean there's a whole fight going on about whether this plane was a facility for purposes of the of the statute because he's saying that the plane was a facility which is clearly wrong but the fact is when they say oh you know justice ginsburg traveled and justice Breyer traveled we know that because they disclosed their travel right. they disclosed it so you can kind of go around the world and eat chicken at bad places, but don't tell us that it's none of our business. So the int <clears throat> so there's two issues. If, uh, as you have said, one of the issues with the court is that most people reporting on the court are there to report on the jurisprudence, the cases, the the, the background of, of why these cases come to be. They were most times when I'm interviewing you, it's about the cases. Now it's become a little bit about the court, and that's a different role for a lot of reporters. So the thing that people need to understand is that there are ethics and there are the rules that they have to follow. The rules are very few, but we don't have ethics, ethics rules for Supreme Court justices the way we do for other federal courts. Right. The Supreme Court justices are supposed to be policing themselves. Right. Uh, it is there is no way to enforce this, they say. And so they're each sort of a law unto themselves. And that's why you get Justice Alito kind of looking around for a dictionary where he can find somewhere, somewhere a definition of air travel as facilities. Right. There is not the ability for them to enforce it against one another. And that raises the burden on them to be scrupulous and meticulous the way every other government official is right. about abiding by the law. And the other thing I would just say is that it's really essential that when they say that we're taking them down, what they're doing is making a monarchic argument right. about how they are above the law. Yeah, we're not allowed to That's do that. terrifying. It is Friday, the 23rd of June of 2023. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. Precious, the little Yorkie, is our door girl. And she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. That's right. Put that in your hopper. Okay. So, uh, everything that I had surmised about the submersible in the moments when we had heard that it had been, quote, lost, uh, sadly has come to fruition, and that is a sad state of affairs. 
Even uh, more sad, though, was 700 people drowning in the Mediterranean, and uh, not much, uh, well, actually, a lot more than it would have gotten if it hadn't been <clears throat> for the, uh, the submersible Titan. So, uh, so let that be the epitaph. <laughs> will it be? Or will it be a uh, memorial to uh, engineering and engineering gone bad? And what is that epithet? Well, it might be just uh, safety is a waste. Okay. Now, the reason Stockton Rush said that safety is a waste is because innovators sometimes have to push the envelope break a few rules. But, um, you know, sometimes uh, being a little prudent <laughs> might uh, be okay, especially when lives are, are involved in it, even your own. So uh, how many times have we uh, seen people who built a plane? Oh, yeah, I built this plane in my garage. Now I'm going to go test uh, fly it. Uh, you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> I'll charge you 250 grand to sit in the seat right here. I'll even let you play with the controls every now and then. How's that? Okay. So, uh, apparently, uh, they got enough people to try that. Now, they signed a waiver. Okay. And apparently, that waiver says right there, none of this is legal. Okay, caveat emptor, buyer beware. And they were, poor 19-year-old kid, though, he was frightened. He, I, Who wouldn't be? Now, I hear that uh, as far as submersibles go, it is huge. But at 21 feet, I got to tell you, I've had a 45-foot uh, Chris Craft, and uh, it seems small. <laughs> That's double what the 21 feet is of this craft, the Titan. But others are just like tiny little places. Your your knees are literally up against your chest the whole time, and you're in. It's only big enough for two, maybe three people. So uh, five people being able to spread out, having a little commode to sit on. They played music. They played music when uh, the, the commode was in use. I don't think they had a chance this last time. Maybe. Never know. Unheated. It's cold down there. So, uh, but I guess we would have never heard of the 700 that died, drowned, lost in the Mediterranean. Overloaded boat. Well, I guess there are two tiers of justice. There must be. Speaking of which, uh, boy, talk about the Republican Party being the insurgent party trying to overthrow the United States of America. Yikes. And and as usual, when you have these right-wing uh, movements, there's always a lot of infighting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yikes. Indeed. So, uh, you got Berbert. And you got uh, MTG in there. They're trying to figure out who is the meanest of the mean girls. Okay. Well, you know, they're both uh, sort of, well, I guess MTG has a new boyfriend now. But uh, the Berbert girl, Bobo, uh, she's she's available. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, they're trying to draw in. Impeach or articles of impeachment against Joe, because I guess the Republicans think that, you know, impeachment is just like a political gambit. You know, you, you throw it out there like uh, woke. And they they keep saying they're not a cult. I don't know what it is. It's a movement. that's a little bizarre. That's all I can say. Not just a little, a lot. So... Okay, well, you know, it is Friday, and uh, we do have a bit of a curated show for you as we end the week. And, uh, oh, <clears throat> I should mention, 
I put myself in a media bubble so that I don't see a whole lot. So I, the Supreme Court is to uh, release decisions, and we may be going to hell in a handbasket more than we already are. But uh, unless I lift my head up and actually see, I'm probably not going to know what those are if they happen to come out during showtime. I just don't know. Okay. I might find out during a break, and then we'll find out. But nonetheless, what do we have in store for you today? Well, speaking of the Supreme Court, a common player, Leonard Leo, in the recent recent Supreme Court scandals, exposes a broader project to manipulate the court. And I keep telling you, if you let those billionaire Nazi burgermeisters take over, this is exactly what would happen. And it is. On the rest of the menu, an Iowa meteorologist resigned after an 18-year career in television citing PTSD from threats over his climate change coverage. Mm-hmm. And then we had this we had this uh, report that came out and blamed scientists for not letting people know soon enough about all this terrible stuff that's happening with climate change. What? What I remember is a decades-long propaganda effort by big oil to denigrate, marginalize, and character assass- or assassinate the character of any scientist who even mentioned the term climate change or global warming. Give me a break. Okay. Abortion pills will remain legal in Wyoming for now. And the lawsuit protesting the Arizona governor's refusal to execute prisoners has been dismissed. After the break, we move to the chef's table where nearly 1.5 million foreign pilgrims have have arrived in Saudi Arabia so far for the annual Hajj pilgrimage. And the Qatar Sovereign Wealth Fund is set to buy a stake in Washington's NBA, NHL, and WNBA sports teams. And that is sports washing times three. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Page at netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link. And the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, and we thank Kelly for doing so. Off to the left across the page from that chat room link near the bottom of our home page at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, and if you could afford to send us what you might spend on, oh, I don't know. How about an espresso-type coffee drink? Oh, it just came to me. If you could afford to send us those funds once a month, it really does help us pay our bills and all the other costs that are incurred in running this powerhouse of resistance, as we have been running this powerhouse of resistance for over a dozen years now. Oh, my God. And we have you to thank for your generosity in allowing us to fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended so many, many, many years ago. And uh, we continue uh, to rely on your help. So thank you for truly making this, well, crowdsourced. Okay, if you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Or all of those. And thank you, Tom, for doing that and everything else. 
Follow me on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. And you can always find all of the show notes and links diaries if you go to my social media feed because the links are all there. Yes, they are. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts, please do at uh, Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., 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 etc. All right, this uh, first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Washington Post by Daniel Wu. When Iowa meteorologist Chris Gloninger got an email notification last June, it read... Getting sick and tired of your liberal conspiracy on the weather. What's your address? Another asked Gloninger a few days later. We conservative Iowans would like to give you an Iowan welcome you will never forget. Wow, is that how they speak in Iowa? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. The emails arrived relentlessly in Gloninger's inbox for another month. The sender accused the award-winning meteorologist who spoke frequently about the effects of climate change of being a conspiracy theorist and a worthless Biden puppet. Another told Gloninger to go east and drown from the ice cap melting. Gloninger, the chief meteorologist at Des Moines news station KCCI, shared some of the messages on social media in July and said they had taken a toll on him. I'm trying to put it behind me, he told the Washington Post. But at the same point, I think it brings awareness to what journalists face day to day bringing the news. The episode ultimately led to the meteorologist to a career altering decision. Gloninger is departing KCCI and his career in TV news in July, he announced on Wednesday, citing family health issues and post-traumatic stress he suffered after receiving the threats. KCCI did not immediately respond to a request for comment. of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here on the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Abortion pills will remain legal in Wyoming for now after a judge ruled yesterday Thursday that the state's first in the nation law to ban them won't take effect on July 1st as planned while a lawsuit proceeds. Attorneys for Wyoming failed to show that the ban would not harm the plaintiffs before their lawsuit is resolved. Teton County Judge Melissa Owens ruled after hearing arguments from both sides. Meanwhile, those plaintiffs have clearly showed probable success on the merits, Owens said. While other states have instituted de facto bans on the medication by broadly prohibiting abortion, only Wyoming has specifically banned abortion pills. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled in April that access to one of the two pills, mifepristone, may continue while litigants seek to overturn the FDA's approval of it. Wyoming's pill ban is being challenged by four women, including two obstetricians and two nonprofit organizations. One of the groups, Wellspring Health Access, opened as the state's first full-service abortion clinic in years in April following an, following an arson attack in 2022. They are also suing to stop a near-total ban on abortion enacted in Wyoming in March. Owens has suspended that law, too, and combined the two lawsuits. Because abortion remains legal in Wyoming, 
banning abortion pills would require women to get more invasive surgical and abortions instead, Marcy Bramlett, an attorney for the ban opponents, told Owens in Thursday's hearing. It effectively tells people you must have open-heart surgery when a stent would do, she said. A state constitutional amendment enacted in 2012 also came into play in court arguments. The amendment passed in response to the Affordable Care Act, former President Barack Obama's health care law, says Wyoming residents have the right to make their own health care decisions. Oh, do they? Wyoming's new abortion laws allow exceptions to save life and for cases of rape or incest that are reported to the police. But abortion, for other reasons, isn't health care under the amendment. Jay Jurdy, an attorney for the state, argued. It's not restoring a woman's body from pain, injury, or physical sickness, Jurdy said. Medical services are involved, but getting an abortion for reasons other than health care, it can't be a medical decision. Oh, bite me. Pregnancy involves pain and sickness, Owens pointed out, but women don't get abortions for that reason, countered Jurdy. Attorneys for the plaintiffs later questioned how the state could know the motives of women getting abortions. Wyoming's new laws were enacted after the U.S. Supreme Court, we like to call it the MAGA court, the corrupt MAGA court, you know, the ones that have been bought off, those guys. Well, they struck down Roe v. Wade last year. Since then, some 25 million women and teenagers have been subjected to either stricter controls on ending their pregnancies or almost total bans on the procedure. In central Wyoming, services at Wellspring Health Access include pill abortions, a method for ending pregnancy that is used in more than half of all U.S. abortions, said Julie Burkhart, Wellspring's president, in a statement. Previously, only one other clinic in Wyoming, a woman's health center in Jackson, some 250 miles away, offered pill abortions. Wyoming officials didn't immediately return a request for comment, but previously have promised to vigorously defend the legality of the new law. Bill Yu of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A lawsuit that alleged Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs exceeded her power in refusing to execute a prisoner earlier this year has been dismissed at the request of attorneys on both sides of the case. The lawsuit dismissed yesterday, Thursday, had tried unsuccessfully to force the Democratic governor, who had ordered a review of Arizona's death penalty protocols because of the state's history of mismanaged executions, to carry out the execution of Aaron Gunches for his murder conviction in the 2002 killing of Ted Price. Hobbs has vowed to not carry out any death sentences, sentences until there is confidence the state can do so without violating the law. Democratic Attorney General Chris May's office had said it would not seek any court orders to execute prisoners while the governor's review of the death penalty procedures is underway. In the weeks leading up to the April 6 ex execution date set for Gunches by the state's highest court, Hobbs' office also maintained the state was not prepared to enforce the death penalty, 
saying it lacked staff with expertise to carry out executions, was unable to find an IV team to carry out the lethal injection, and did not have a contract with a pharmacist to compound the pentabarbital needed uh, for an execution. But a dismissal agreement filed earlier this week by attorneys on both sides of the lawsuit provided an update on the state's readiness to enforce death sentences. It said the state has had staff in place to carry out executions as of May 5th and will look for a compounding pharmacist. Maricopa County Attorney Rachel Mitchell, the top prosecutor for Metro Phoenix, who, along with two of Price's relatives that filed the lawsuit against Hobbs, said the civil case was resolved because it answered the question of whether the state was prepared to carry out another execution. Still, Mitchell left open the possibility that she would ask a court in the future to let her seek execution warrants, which are normally requested by the Attorney General's office. Well, let us now go to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, just keep telling yourself it's the 14th highest grossing franchise ever. By and large, the cartoons of the 80s never claimed to be highbrow entertainment. Instead, they were all about fun, action, and in the case of the Transformers, above all, about selling toys for Hasbro. Much like earlier installments in the classic 80s animated movie, Transformers Rise of the Beasts continues the plot from 2019's Bumblebee, with characters that originated on the TV show, plus some new ones. After stealing a Porsche that turns out to be a Transformer, young Brooklyn native and military tech wizard Noah is recruited along with museum worker Elena by Earth-based Autobots to help retrieve a mysterious so-called transwarp key that could send the robots back to Cybertron, the world from which they were forced to evacuate by the planet-eating god Unicron. A more nuanced plot than you might expect unfolds as the competing interests of the protagonists work out. The action scenes are suitably impressive for a $200 million action film in 2023, as is the voice talent for the bots, including Michelle Yo, Pete Davidson, Ron Perlman, Peter Dinklage, and even Peter Cullen, the original Optimus Prime. Nostalgia is enhanced with lots of 90s references and an impressive classic hip-hop soundtrack, which is meant to appeal to the kids who grew up on the cartoon and are now middle-aged. And for the most part, it works. Transformers Rise of the Beast is, overall, a fun movie with some gripping sequences and exotic shooting locations, including no less than Machu Picchu. The bar for a film in this franchise isn't high, but in addition to a great look, Michael Bay and company actually succeed in making you feel something for alien robots. And that's saying something. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. Hi, and welcome to Your Health Quickly, a Scientific American podcast series. On this show, we highlight the latest vital health news, discoveries that affect your body and your mind. Every episode, we dive into one topic. We discuss diseases, treatments, and some controversies. And we demystify the medical research and ways you can use to stay healthy. I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. We're Scientific American senior health editors. Today, we're talking about the best way to beat the heat this summer. Your body has evolved a natural technique for cooling down rapidly, and it's remarkably effective. We'll discuss how to take full advantage of it. It's hot out. It's sweltering. The sun beats down on your head. Breezes are distant memories. Welcome to summer. Hey, it's not that bad. I prefer warm weather to the cold. 
I like doing more things outside. It's easier to convince myself to go for runs and bike rides. And I love those long summer days when it stays light so late out. Okay, I like summer too. But the fact is heat can be dangerous. We've been getting more and more blistering summer heat waves. About 1,300 people in the U.S. die because of extreme heat every year. Yeah, and that's because high heat makes your body work extra hard to cool down. That can lead to heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Heat can be especially harmful for people with heart and respiratory diseases. Even when it's just normally hot, say in the high 80s and the 90s, it's pretty easy to get uncomfortable. You sweat, you pant, and you just want to cool down fast. Everybody's got their favorite tricks for doing that. After you go running, Tanya, what's your go-to cool-down method? I like to splash water in my face and drink some cold water. Mine is to ditch my shoes and socks as fast as possible and walk barefoot on a cool floor. And it turns out, according to physiologists who study temperature regulation, both our techniques are actually pretty effective strategies. Wow, the cold floor technique really helps? Yeah, I didn't know this, but the soles of your feet and the palms of your hands are keys to fast cooldowns. Some athletes have even started using special cooling gloves to recover quickly after a hot workout. Hmm, your palms? That's not very much surface area, so it doesn't seem like they would cool your whole body down, right? I agree. It is a bit weird. So I turned to one of the scientists working in this area to explain it. I'm Craig Heller. I'm a professor of biology at Stanford. I study human temperature regulation and its role in performance. A quick heads up here. Craig talks about temperature using the Celsius scale. To get to Fahrenheit, multiply his numbers by 1.8. Then add 32. Or you can just remember that when he says 37 degrees, that's 98.6 Fahrenheit. And 40 Celsius is 104 Fahrenheit. Our body temperatures are regulated normally around 37 degrees. By the time we get to 40 degrees, we're not functioning normally. We live very close to the edge. That's because we're mammals. We're warm-blooded. We've evolved to be good at maintaining a warm body temperature. And most mammals have a nice blanket of insulating hair all over their bodies. Even people are covered with millions of hair follicles. The hairs are just a lot thinner and shorter than they are in other animals. Which means that when it comes to losing heat, we generally suck. Our bodies do, however, have a kind of emergency temperature relief valve. And Craig has been studying it. That valve is a special type of blood vessel. And this week, it's my turn to get stuck with the hard science word, so here goes. They're called arteriovenous anastomoses. Very nice. Why, thank you. I practiced. A lot. But let's call them AVAs from now on. Most arteries and veins connect through a bed of very thin capillaries that bring nutrients and oxygen to cells. AVAs, though, are different. They're direct junctions of arteries and veins, so blood flows through them pretty quickly. And the real key to their heat relief function is that they're concentrated in just a few places in the body. Here's Craig again. We found that in the palm of the hand, the soles of the feet, and the upper part of the face, which are called non-hairy skin, there are special blood vessels. And those blood vessels can shunt the blood from the arteries to the veins directly, bypassing the capillaries. No mammals have fur. If you have fur, you can't dissipate heat over your overall body surface very efficiently. So mammals have these special blood vessels in their non-hairy skin, the pads of their feet, the tongue, the ears in some cases. To see if they could take advantage of AVAs in people, back in the early 2000s, Craig and his colleague Dennis Grun basically MacGyvered this goofy device. They put a plexiglass cylinder around someone's hand and sealed it around their arm with part of a wetsuit sleeve. Inside the cylinder, cool water ran over the palm. After a person exercised, those AVAs pulled in hot blood from the core of the body. The blood gave off its heat to the cooler water, which was at about 56 degrees. Then, cooled down, that blood would circulate back to the body's core and lower the heat there. People returned to regular body temperature in just a few minutes. We couldn't believe it. Now, this stuff gets published in places like the Journal of Applied Physiology. And since these guys are at Stanford, a university with a bunch of elite sports teams, it starts getting attention at the gym. Because athletes work out hard, get overheated and exhausted, and normally have to quit for the day, or at least several hours. But 
Craig and Grant built a few more versions of this cooling mitten and handed them out. Athletes would put them on between workout sets, cool down in about three minutes, and jump up and do another set. Craig tells a story of one guy who did 618 pull-ups in about 20 minutes. Some women athletes did 900 push-ups in that short time period. Wow, that's about 899 more push-ups than I could do. And he's selling the gloves now, right? Yeah, they're called cool mitts. Heller says some pro football players on the San Francisco 49ers also adopted these gloves. Well, I wouldn't mind a pair of those on the New York subway in summer, just saying. But we should be really clear that we're not endorsing this product. No, we're really not. It's probably a fine device, but it hasn't been exhaustively tested in a variety of people. And it costs about 1500 bucks. But product aside, there is some cool science behind it, literally. So when it gets really hot and I feel signs of heat stress, heavy sweating, clammy skin, muscle cramps, dizziness, what's a good way to cool down if I'm not putting on one of those gloves? Should I dunk my body in an ice bath? Well, Heller says that could work. The problem is it's not very convenient. I don't have a giant ice bath handy, do you? No, but I did used to stand in an ice bath after high school cross-country practices. But seriously, could I just stick my feet in a bucket of ice water? Not so much. You've got AVAs in your feet. But remember, the idea is to get more blood flowing through them. Icy water is a shock, and it makes blood vessels constrict. So you are actually getting less blood through your AVAs, not more. The water in Heller's gloves in the mid-50s is cool, but it's not too cold. Okay, that makes sense. What about running my hands or forehead under a cold tap? That's your post-run remedy today, right? Heller says that's smart. The water's cool, but not freezing, and you're getting it onto the AVAs in your palms and on your face. What about air conditioning? Does that help at all? AC is good. It's not the fastest cool down, but it definitely helps. You can also drink cold water. That will bring your core temperature down pretty quickly. Be careful not to guzzle a huge amount, though. Too much water dilutes the fluids that carry signals amongst your cells, and that can lead to heart trouble and seizures, among other things. Yeah, we talked about that on the last Your Health Quickly episode. What about a towel soaked in cold water draped over my neck? That is actually a terrible idea, according to our body heat expert. Wait, really? The reason is that the brain has a thermostat that it uses to trigger the body's natural cooling mechanisms, like sweating or passing blood through those AVAs. And that brain region is located near the back of the neck. It uses neck skin temperature and blood temps in the major vessels there to measure how hot you are. So your cold towel is going to fool the brain's thermostat into thinking that your whole body's cooled down. It's going to shut down all of your other natural cooling methods, and you'll stay uncomfortably and sometimes dangerously hot. Wow, good to know. I guess I will stick with splashing cool water on my face and hands. Well, that is the mammal-approved heat fix, and it should certainly help you chill out. Your Health Quickly is produced by Talika Bose, Jeff Del Vicio, and Kelso Harper. It's edited by Ella Fetter and Alexa Lim. Our music is composed by Dominic Smith. Our show is part of Scientific American's podcast, Science Quickly. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, give us a rating or a review. And if you have ideas for topics we should cover, send us an email at yourhealthquickly at siam.com. That's yourhealthquickly at siam.com. For a daily dose of science, sign up for our new Today in Science newsletter. Our colleague Andrea Garaleski delivers some of the most interesting and awe-inspiring science news and opinion to your inbox each afternoon. We really think you'll enjoy it. Check it out at siam.com slash newsletters. For Your Health Quickly, I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. Thanks for listening. This is the story of a very special woman. In a matter of seconds, she turned herself into a great mathematician or an entrepreneur. Her knowledge was limitless and still is. She could also make monsters disappear, especially those that lurked in the shadows under the bed. Once, this woman put back together a teenage girl's broken heart, which had been shattered in a thousand pieces. 
just by giving her a bear hug. She masqueraded as a regular person at work, but as a superhero at home. Everyone knows her as Gabriella. I still call her mom. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need to help, complete with tips and resources, at aarp.org caregiving. A public service announcement brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Hey, hon, what you doing with your phone? Taking pictures? No, I'm asking you questions. Like what? Hey, Bobo, do flowers have best friends? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, follow me. I want to show you something. Look, flowers do have best friends. Whoa. Some answers can only be found in nature. Discover the unsearchable. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a trail near you. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. Ready for our little forest adventure? Yes! Yeah, I want to go outside, I want to be. We're here. Whoa, that was fast. There's a forest closer than you think. Find a park or forest near you and music inspired by nature at discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by USDA Forest Service and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to netrootsradio.com, Show your progressive side and go to the donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Why did George Floyd die? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. One answer, because former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, who's white, pressed his knee into George Floyd's neck, Floyd is black, for nine and a half minutes and suffocated him. Other officers assisted or did nothing to stop Chauvin, who is now in prison, for murder. There's another answer. 60% of the time that Minneapolis cops have used force, it's against black residents, although black residents make up only 20% of the city's population. And city police officers have stopped black drivers six and a half times more often than white drivers and then disproportionately and inappropriately searched and handcuffed them. And the police have often used excessive force, including against persons who committed a petty offense or no offense at all. And also, they've shot at people without determining if there was an immediate threat and regularly discriminated against Native Americans as well as black residents. These facts are set forth in a recent DOJ report, which will result in a consent decree with the city to institute police reforms. Attorney General Merrick Garland said that there were many Minneapolis police officers who did their job with professionalism, courage, and respect. But the report makes clear how intolerable behavior by police was tolerated and condoned. As the attorney general said, the patterns and practices of the police department made what happened to George Floyd possible. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU, because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1947. That was the day that many labor historians mark as the beginning of a long decline of the U.S. labor movement. The United States Congress passed the Taft-Hartley Act. The bill was named after Republican Senator Robert A. Taft from Ohio. The son of President William Howard Taft, the senator had been a staunch opponent of President Roosevelt's New Deal policies. He continued his anti-working class efforts with a new bill aimed to curb the power of unions. He found an ally in Representative Fred Hartley, a Republican congressman from New Jersey. After World War II, a wave of strikes washed over the nation. Most labor unions had agreed not to go on strike during the war, but frustrations over wages and working conditions mounted. In the years after the conflict ended, five million workers walked the picket lines. One in four private sector workers was a union member. Labor was on the march. The Congressional Republicans passed the Taft-Hartley Act in response. 
the bill ushered in limits on the right to strike. It also began the era of so-called right to work, allowing states to pass laws, making it more difficult for unions to collect dues and represent workers. The new law also required union leaders to sign affidavits that they were not communists, bringing the Red Scare to the House of Labor. A massive rally at Madison Square Garden in New York City asked President Truman to veto the slave labor bill. President Truman did veto the bill, but Congress overrode his veto. Today, only 12% of workers are in unions. 26 states are so-called right-to-work states, to the great detriment of workers' living standards and their health and safety. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, on the west coast of the continental United States of America, because there's lots more of us where we come from, where it is currently 61 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs in the mid-80s, a little cooler than yesterday. Sunny conditions should prevail throughout the day and then becoming partly cloudy later on. A stray shower or thunderstorm is possible later in the day. Winds will be out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. A few passing clouds overnight, otherwise generally clear. A stray shower or thunderstorm is also possible. Lows in the mid to upper 50s. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Then partly cloudy tomorrow with a stray shower or thunderstorm possible. Highs in the mid to upper 80s. Winds out of the west northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Grass pollen is rated very high here in our little town of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the good range, though it's ticked up a few points at 23 parts per million, and that daytime UV index remains very high at level 9, so take care. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.98 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 78%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. And that's why it's called the Weather Underground, because it is the Weather Underground. London is 80 degrees and fair. Paris is 83 and sunny. Rome is 84 and fair with a warning for thunderstorm activity that could impact critical electrical infrastructure. Kiev is 86 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 81 and clear. Hong Kong is 85 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 72 and mostly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 51 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 57 degrees, cloudy with a small craft advisory on the bay for heavy fog. And New York, New York is 68 degrees Fahrenheit with rain. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Thank you. 
Rizat Boot of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Muslim pilgrims streamed into the holy city of Mecca today, Friday, ahead of the start of Hajj next week, as the annual pilgrimage returns to its monumental scale after three years of heavy restrictions because of the coronavirus pandemic. Saudi officials say close to 1.5 million foreign pilgrims have arrived in the country so far, the vast majority by air, more are expected, and hundreds of thousands of Saudis and others living in Saudi Arabia will also join them when the pilgrimage officially begins on Monday. Saudi officials have said they expect the number of pilgrims to reach pre-pandemic levels. In 2019, more than 2.4 million Muslims made the pilgrimage. Today, pilgrims throng the Grand Mosque in Mecca to attend weekly communal prayers, Many then did a ritual circuit, walking seven times around the Kaaba, the cube-shaped structure inside the Grand Mosque that is Islam's holiest site. Last night, Thursday, the vast marble court around the Kaaba was packed with the faithful, walking nearly shoulder to shoulder. In stark contrast to scenes two years ago, at the height of the pandemic, when the sparse numbers kept far from each other in the nearly empty court, as they walk the circuit. Carrying umbrellas against the sun and temperatures reaching about 107 degrees Fahrenheit, pilgrims walked uh, for miles from bus lots into the Grand Mosque area in central Mecca, often jostling with barricades set up by security forces to direct the giant flows of people. Many pilgrims converged on nearby shops and malls to buy souvenirs. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux. Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, reste toujours fidèle. C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Stephen Wino of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Cutter's Sovereign Wealth Fund is buying a roughly 5% stake in the parent company of the NBA's Washington Wizards, NHL's Washington Capitals, and the WNBA's Washington Mystics as part of a $4.05 billion deal. A person with knowledge of the sale said yesterday, Thursday, the person spoke to the Associated Press and they didn't want anyone to know who they are because the agreement between the Cutter Investment Authority and Monumental Sports and Entertainment had not been announced until now. It is believed to be the first time the government of Qatar is investing in U.S. professional sports. Sportico first reported the transaction, saying it is the first time any sovereign wealth fund has bought into ownership of an American team. It is not Qatar's first big foray into major sports, though. The Middle Eastern country last year hosted Soccer's World Cup for the first time, helping FIFA reach a record revenue level because of booming ticket and hospitality sales, and they promised they could buy beer, but no one could. Qatar Sports Investments has owned majority control of French soccer club Paris Saint-Germain since 2011. The same group agreed in October to buy a 22% stake in Portuguese club Braga. Getting into a top U.S. market, even as a minority partner, is further expansion of 
Qatari reach into the sports world. An expert in such transactions said sports are part of Qatar's nation branding and public diplomacy strategy and that this move aligns with the strategy. Government and QIA officials in Qatar, which hosts the forward headquarters of the U.S. Military Central Command, declined to comment when reached by the AP. It has used its natural gas wealth to raise its profile internationally while also facing a years-long boycott by regional countries over a political dispute. Cutter's potential purchase also renews questions that followed it during the FIFA World Cup, which include concerns over its human rights record when it comes to LGBTQ plus rights and its treatment of laborers in the country. We'll keep an eye on that. And that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day and the week. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we will meet up here on Monday for River City Hash Monday. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day, all night, and all weekend for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here on Monday, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver